Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pod's Sleep Stories. My name is Arif, and tonight I will be your guide as we travel to the vibrant banks of the Mississippi River to unwind with the classic great American novel, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Before we begin, however, let us relax and find comfort in the space that we are in here and now. Gently and slowly close your eyes. With your eyes closed, find a comfortable position on your mattress. Here and now, there are no obligations. There is no to-do list. All you need to do at this moment is lie in your bed and allow your body to rest. Relax your muscles. Let go of any thoughts that might occupy your mind and follow the sound of my voice. Try and imagine a small orb of light hovering over your body. It is a warm and soft orange light, shimmering just enough to give your room a soothing glow. You feel the heat of the orb radiating through the night air as it inches closer and closer to you. Gently, ever so slowly, the orb taps the crown of your head. And as it touches you, you feel its warmth ripple over you. Feel as it spreads from the top of your head down over your eyes, relaxing them. Then down over your cheeks and your jaw, urging your jaw to unclench and your tongue to fall away from the roof of your mouth and simply relax on the bottom with no strain or tension. Follow that ripple as it travels down to your neck. If you are feeling any discomfort there, if your neck area seems twisted or sore from a long day, surrender to the warmth of the orb washing over it. Feel each and every muscle completely relax there allowing you to feel much looser. Then that ripple continues on, washing over your shoulders and reminding you to lower them away from your ears, giving your body the space that it needs and decreasing any rigidness there. Follow that ripple as it travels over your chest. Feel that warmth melt away the tightness in your chest. With your next breath in, feel how much space you now have in your lungs. Feel your chest expand more and more as you take yet another long, deep breath in. And now turn your attention to your heart as the warmth of this radiant light allows it to beat more calmly and more slowly. You are safe here, 
and with the help of this light, your body will come to realize that. The ripple continues on, trailing down over your back, stomach, and arms. Feel your fists unclench and your hands loosen up as your fingers unfurl and lie flat, free to sink deeper into the mattress beneath them. Feel the weight of the day melt away from your back and your arms, leaving you with muscles that feel completely and totally relaxed. And then, imagine that glowing orange wave making its way down both of your legs. Feel as your legs become just a bit heavier with total and complete relaxation. And now that we have taken the time to relax and find comfort in the space that we are in here and now, let us begin our story. It was a sunny, beautiful day on the shores of the Mississippi River in St. Petersburg, Missouri. Summer was perhaps the most beautiful time of year along the river. Children were splashing in the water with abandon, soaking up the warm rays of the sun as they played from sunrise to sunset. They would sing songs and laugh and truly appreciate the river in a way that it seemed none of the adults did. The river was their home for many months out of the year. This was where they could get away from chores, get away from the expectations of the world, and just float by, telling stories, and watching leaves make their way downstream on the never-ending current that came from far, far upstream. Overhead, the birds were especially boisterous this time of year. They, too, were embracing the beauty and bounty of nature and the great land that they were so fortunate to be born on. They would sing their songs out into the universe as they flitted from blooming branch to blooming branch. The only thing that was ever on their minds was their next meal and how truly beautiful the day ahead of them was. The adults, of course, found their work on the river. They'd sail in boats of all kinds down the river to the next town to sell goods and do business deals. Some of the boats were flashy, while some were mere canoes. And it was on that river, on a warm summer day, that Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer sat together, dangling their feet in the water. The boys were blissful, soaking in the sun overhead and savoring the refreshing feel of the water running over their calloused feet. But Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer were fairly far from your average kids. As a result of past adventures 
and fearless spirit imbued on them by the mighty Mississippi. Each of them had come into a considerable amount of money. And, if anyone had needed it, it was poor Huck Finn. His father, Pap, was a cruel, heartless man who spent more time drinking than caring for his son. In fact, Huck knew that his father didn't care for him. The entire town knew. It was that obvious. So, Huck was put into the care of Widow Douglas and her sister, Miss Watson. Having been raised wild with a father like Pap, Huck was far, far from a civilized boy. He had quite a thirst for adventure and quite a disregard for what many others considered to be societal norms. Being brought into a house with two women that cared about him was vastly different from the life he had grown accustomed to with his cruel father. Believing it was her duty and having that deep appreciation for Huck, Widow Douglas set out to civilize little Huckleberry Finn. She taught him lessons all hours of the day, and when she found Huck staring off into space, or doodling on his paper, or gazing wistfully out of the trees, she often couldn't keep herself from sighing and smiling at the spirited boy before her. Whenever she gave him work to do, Huck would groan about it. When he was taught about religion for the very first time, Huck was far from a model student. When he was told to pray before meals, he would groan about having to grumble over food before every meal. But when he was first taught lessons about Moses, Huck was enthralled. The magic, the far distant lands, parting of the Red Sea, those were all things that seemed plucked out of the kind of story he would like to tell. Where is Moses now? He asked Widow Douglas, stars in his eyes. She scrunched her brow at the boy and tried to hide her smile as she told him, Darling boy, Moses has been dead for quite some time. Huck groaned and put his head on the table, immediately losing interest. He wondered what the point of learning about a dead man was anyway. During all this praying and all these lessons, Huck truly just wanted to be by his best friend's side. Tom Sawyer was the greatest thing that ever happened to him. His partner in crime, his best friend. When Miss Watson mentioned that the poorly behaved boy would not end up in heaven, Huck was overjoyed, proclaiming, good, I wanted him and me to be together. After many days of studying without going outside, Huck went to bed and was surprised to hear a meow sound radiate from just outside his window. Delighted, Huck leapt to his feet 
and approached the window, responding with a meow of his own. Outside the window, Tom Sawyer stood, waiting in the yard with a smile. The two traipsed out that night, having to hide from Widow Douglas's slave, a kind man named Jim. The next morning, the two inseparable friends were able to escape Huck's lessons for the day and travel by boat to a cave. Along the way, they laughed and splashed in the water, teasing and poking fun at one another as they journeyed further and further down the Grand Mississippi River. Huck was relieved to finally be free of the books and prayers that awaited him back home with Widow Douglas. He was where he belonged, out in nature with his friends, his friends that would soon become a gang. But not just any gang. They were to become a band of robbers, a band of robbers dubbed Tom Sawyer's Gang. It was an ambitious goal for a group of children. They were to sail the Mississippi, finding gold and adventure wherever they went. But about a month after Tom's gang was created, everyone quit. They had spent a lot of afternoons on the river and in the cave but had certainly not done any robbing or kidnapping, which made having a gang seem a tad bit unnecessary. And though the gang was no more, the fun the children had together went on for months and months. They spent those summer days on the river sailing up and down in the sun and telling stories to one another. Huck often narrowed his eyes at Tom's tall tales of genies and magic lamps and groups of people with camels. But there was nothing he would rather hear as he dangled his hand into the water and closed his eyes, floating along the river, completely at peace. In autumn, when the water was becoming too cold to swim in, the children took their adventures to the woods, where they would traipse through the autumn-painted forests, gazing up at the trees that were ablaze with red, orange, and yellow. They would leap into the leaves with a flourish, sending the leaves scattering across the forest floor like nature's confetti. On occasion, Widow Douglas would bake a fresh apple pie for the boys giving them a little taste of the bounty of the land. And soon, winter swept across the land. The Mississippi first became sluggish, then peppered with ice and snow. The forests were breathtakingly beautiful. Heavy snow weighed down the pine and cypress trees, and ice coated each and every maple branch, causing the entire forest to sparkle like it was made of twinkling diamonds. The winter was time for sledding and snowball fights, and all the other adventures that boys Huck and Tom's age enjoyed so dearly. 
by winter, Huck had started to really improve in school. Finally, he was able to read and teachers noticed many other changes in the young boy thanks to the help of Widow Douglas. But one winter day, Huck's joyful demeanor was tested. Outside of his window, he spotted a man's boot prints in the snow. And in that print, Huck could see two nails crossed on the boot. Two nails that he recognized. Huck knew that it was his father's footprints. Pap had been here. Scared, he raced to the judge in charge of the fortune he had previously acquired, begging the judge to buy his fortune for a dollar. The confused judge agreed and watched as Huck raced back to the house. But when Huck went into his bedroom, he found his father waiting for him. Huck's father was not a good sight. He was an angry man, a cruel man. He was angry at Huck for learning how to read, angry at Huck for wanting to be better than him. When Huck told Pap that he didn't have the money anymore, Pap called him a liar. He disappeared into the night, stealing Huck's last dollar so he could journey off to buy something to drink. But the next morning, things got worse. Pap showed up at Judge Thatcher's, demanding that he get Huck's money. Judge Thatcher and Widow Douglas argued with Pap, trying to get custody of Huck away from Pap. But the new judge in town refused this wish, telling them that he would never separate a father and son. After several long days, Pap kidnapped Huck, taking him deep into the woods to live in a secluded cabin on the shore of the Mississippi River in Illinois. Locked inside there as his father journeyed through the countryside, Huck felt helpless. And yet, he found himself dreaming of brighter days to get by. He thought of those long summer days with Tom. He thought of how the cool water of the Mississippi felt on his sun-kissed skin. He thought of the sounds of the birds that swooped down into the water as the sun began to set. He thought of the way the summer air buzzed with crickets at night and fireflies danced across the street and mingled between the houses, filling the spaces with magic. He found himself smiling in spite of the situation that he was in, and there was immense hope within him. He found a saw and began the task of cutting a hole in the side of the cabin to escape, one that he could keep hidden from Pap. With every scrape of his saw, he felt freedom growing closer and closer. One day, Pap sent Huck out to check the fishing lines in the river. Huck walked along the banks slowly, breathing deeply in and out as he got the first taste of freedom that he had had in quite some time. He couldn't believe how much he had missed the feeling of the breeze on his skin. 
and the smell of the pine and cedar trees. But then, when he saw an empty canoe floating down the river, Huck realized he may have a real shot at freedom. He waded into the water and snagged it out, dragging it onto the banks with a smile on his face. He tucked the canoe away behind some bushes, hiding it from his father. In that beat-up canoe, Huck saw a future without his cruel father, a future in the lush, beautiful woods where he could live the life he had always dreamt of. Later that day, when Pap left, Huck finished sawing out of the house. He took everything of value and put it into the canoe, and then he went back into the cabin, destroying it to make it look like a robbery had occurred. Content with his plan, Huck crept out to the canoe and waited for the moon to rise. As soon as the owls began to hoot from deep within the forest, Huck knew the time was right. He got in the canoe and quietly, swiftly paddled to the nearby island, Jackson's Island. Huck spent three very peaceful days on the island. He picked up fresh, juicy berries from the plants that hung over the shoreline and ate them in the morning. As the sun washed over his face, the berries seemed even sweeter. During the day, he caught fish in the river to eat which he would roast over the crackling fire. For once, he didn't have anyone telling him what to do, and it was rather glorious. He breathed in that fresh air and enjoyed nature's bounty, completely and totally at peace and one with nature. And. Once the sun went down, Huck would lie back in the grass and look up at the starry night sky. He loved how the stars sparkled against the inky blackness of space, how it made him feel so large and important, and so small and magical, all at the same time. It made him feel connected to the world around him, even though he was so very alone during those three days. But then, unexpectedly, he wasn't alone anymore. On the fourth day, while exploring an area of the island, Huck was thrilled to run into Jim. He was pleased to finally have some company in Jim, but that happiness was short-lived. Jim told Huck that he was on the run, since he had reasons to believe that he was to be sold, and he wanted to leave before Miss Watson had a chance to do that. Huck understood, feeling bad for Jim and for the rest of the afternoon, the two spent time talking about the world and discussing legends and superstitions and building an even stronger bond of friendship. From that moment forward, the two's fates were intertwined. They had escaped the weight of the mainland, of society, and had found peace on the island, where food was abundant, 
and they could flourish and relax all day long. But, unfortunately, their peaceful life on the island had to come to an end at some point, since they had no way of knowing what was happening with Huck's father or if people were looking for Jim, they decided that Huck should travel onto the mainland. So one day, Huck, disguised as a girl, hoping to find out about the fate of his father and the public's thoughts on Jim, met a woman named Judith Loftus, who told him that Pap was suspected in Huck's murder, and there was a large reward offered for anyone who could find Jim. Her husband spotted smoke on Jackson Island and was planning to search it that night in pursuit of Jim. Huck raced back to the island and relayed the news to Jim, and they agreed they needed to leave. As the sun began to set over their peaceful little haven, they floated downstream. Huck watched the island fade into the distance. The two constructed a wigwam on their raft and spent several days floating downriver, traveling by the moonlight in order to stay hidden. Though they were on the run, Huck didn't mind. He loved the way the moon sparkled over the water at night, the way it illuminated each wave with a silvery glow. Some nights, he would count the stars with Jim, whispering the numbers under his breath as he gazed up at the sky in wonder. Many nights, the two would talk about their views on the world. Though they were on the run, heading north to the free states, they felt more free floating down the river together than they had for most of their lives. They talked of their past and their future. Jim spoke of his hopes to get a job in a free state and raise enough money to bring his wife and kids to live with him. Huck spoke of the adventures he wanted to go on, of all the exciting journeys ahead of him now that he was free of his father. Jim and Huck grew close to one another over these long few days. Though Huck still missed Tom Sawyer, he was grateful to have a friend and companion in Jim. But soon, their odd little family grew. They stumbled upon two strange grifters, a younger man they referred to as Duke, and an older man, King. The two accompanied them on the ride, serving one great purpose. They could pretend to be the men who had captured Jim, allowing them to pass through towns without anyone questioning if Jim was an escaped slave. However, Duke and King came with some downsides. They were masterful swindlers, putting on plays and odd schemes in order to steal money from people. This caused a fair amount of run-ins with the public, so much so that Jim began to fear Duke and King were going to cause the downfall of them all and get them sent back to their hometown. And Jim was right to fear Duke and King because one day, desperate for money, Duke and King 
sold Jim to a family that intended to sell him back to Miss Watson. Determined to rescue his friend so they could once again be free together, Huck traveled to the people who bought him, Silas and Sally Phelps. When Huck arrived, however, he was surprised to be welcomed with open arms by Sally. Sally was expecting her young nephew, Tom, who she and her husband had last seen when he was just a toddler. She assumed that Huck was Tom and was entirely delighted to see him. Huck smiled, going along with Sally's assumption. If he could just get close enough to them, he could find out where Jim was being kept and they could get out of there. He desperately hoped that this Tom fellow wouldn't arrive before he could put his plan into motion. Later that night, Silas arrived home. He smiled at Huck and brought him in for a hug, cheerfully saying, My, Tom Sawyer, you haven't changed a bit. Huck could not believe what he was hearing. Their nephew was Tom Sawyer, which meant Tom was on his way here, right now. Just then, Huck heard the steamboat whistle on the river. He excused himself, telling the family that he was going to get his bags. Instead, he intercepted his best friend on his way to the farm. Tom embraced Huck in disbelief, having believed that his friend was no longer alive. As he looked at his friend, Huck felt the warmth of their friendship that he so desperately missed. He told him of what had happened, of him pretending to be Tom, and Tom could only smile. He happily agreed to help Huck find Jim and to pose as his own half-brother, Sid, in order to do so. The two returned to the Phelpses, who were delighted to have another guest at their farm. All night, Huck and Tom hoped to hear about Jim, but neither of the adults mentioned him at all. Once darkness fell, the two snuck to a shed out back, where they discovered Jim was being held. Jim cried out with joy upon seeing the boys. Huck, too, was relieved to see his friend after so long apart. While they could easily rescue Jim, Tom, ever the showman, was determined that their plan must have more flair. Stuck on the romantic adventure books he had read, he decided they needed a rope ladder, a moat, and a saw. The convoluted plan only lengthened the amount of time it would take to rescue Jim. And though Huck was amazed by his friend's thirst for adventure, he gradually became frustrated with his grand acts. Days later, Tom, Jim, and Huck made their actual escape. Though their freedom was short-lived, Tom was injured in the escape, and Jim refused to leave his side, wanting to see him healed, though he knew it could mean he would be captured. And, unfortunately, that is just what occurred. Jim was sent back to the Phelpses, along with Huck and Tom, who spent most of the time sleeping 
as he healed. When Tom awakened, he was shocked to learn that Jim was in chains yet again. Unable to hide the truth any longer, Tom told the Phelps and Huck that Jim was actually already a free man. Miss Watson had passed months earlier and stated in her will that Jim was to be freed. Huck was in disbelief, though if anyone would go this far just to have an adventure, it was certainly Tom. Jim was immediately freed and given money and food for the trouble he was put through. Finally, Jim would be able to be a free man. He could build a life for himself and his family. And Huck and Tom were yet to finish their adventures. Though Sally wanted to adopt Huck into the family, he revealed his other plans to Tom. He was going to travel west in search of more adventures, and Tom happily agreed to join him. But Huck also learned that his cruel father had passed on. Finally, Huck was free from the wrath of his father. He could be his own person, away from his father's drunkenness and anger. That night, Huck, Tom, and Jim sat and looked at the stars. They swapped stories as they watched each and every star twinkle against the inky black sky. Tom told the most colorful stories, and Huck and Jim clung to every word, their eyes wide with wonder. They all had a bright future ahead of them, a future that was forged through friendship and adventure. I hope you have enjoyed this story, and it has brought you a night of peaceful, relaxing sleep. Please, join me again tomorrow for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams. <laughs>